All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to day three of the BitCurator Forum. Uh, I'm really excited about this uh, next session. Uh, so our, the next session is entitled Enhancing Use of Born Digital Collections Using Arch with Sarah Beth Seymour and Carl, Carl Blumenthal. Um, I'm Emily Summers, she, her pronouns, and I'll just be doing the housekeeping introductions. So for this session, uh, Lori Podolsky is the Code of Conduct Monitor. Brendan Locke will be on tech support duties, and also Sarah Beth and Carl's colleague Cody will be will handle uh, any questions that arise. There'll be some time for questions in the halfway point of the session, and also at the end. Um, and the, just a note that the Q and A will be recorded for this session. It just makes it easier on, on our end not to have to pause the recording. Um, so now, without further ado, I hand it over to our speakers. Thank you so much. Thanks, Emily. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our session, Enhancing Use of Born Digital Collections Using Arch. Uh, before we get started, uh, we'll introduce ourselves, even though we just got like a, a really nice introduction. Thank you. I'm Sarah Beth Seymour. I'm a program officer here in Archiving and Data Services, and I'm joined with our senior web archivist, Carl Blumenthal, and our product operations manager, Cody Willis. And like I said, we're all in Archiving and Data Services at the Internet Archive. Kind of br briefly go over our agenda before we get started, uh, starting with introductions, of course, and I'll be covering our learning objectives for today in a moment, as well as providing more background on community programs and uh, CARTA specifically, uh, which is uh, the Collaborative Art Archive, and we will be using a data set from this project for our demo portion for today. We will also, uh, get, I'll hand it over to Carl, who will tell more, uh, tell us more about archive, Web Archives' data. We'll have a quick Q&A pause if there are any questions about Web Archives and work files. And then we'll go into the demo portion of our session today uh, with ARCH or Archives Research Compute Hub. More on that in a minute as well. And um, our data analysis demo, like I said. And then we'll have some discussion at the end because we want to hear about um, how ARCH could be useful to you, any um, questions or suggestions that you have for us. And Cody just dropped a bit link, a bit.ly link in the chat. Thanks, Cody. Um, this is where you can follow along and you can also download our uh, data sets uh, if you wanna do the demo alongside us today. Thank you for that. Our learning objectives. So by the end of the session today, you will learn web archive uh, primary sources, research use cases, and how to support them in a way that promotes computational engagement, scholarship, and research. You'll understand the work file format for preservation and computational access. And we will explore representative processes for analyzing computational research data sets with free and open source software. So a lot to cover today in an hour. More background first, like I said, I wanna introduce uh, where we're coming from, what we do here at the Internet Archive and Archiving and Data Services. Uh, a lot of you know the Internet Archive. Uh, we do specialize in web archiving, research, and data services, especially for web published and born digital content. Uh, we partner with over a thousand organizations in over 40 countries, and these are especially higher education, libraries, archives, governments, and social impact and nonprofits who we work with to preserve and provide access to knowledge. These are some of our products, partners, and projects listed here. You probably know of Archivit, which is our uh, web archiving service. It's a set of tools, training, and technical support that Archivit users use to collect, preserve, and describe dynamic web materials. It is also a public access platform where our partners can share their web collections with multiple search, discovery, and access capabilities. And we also have Vault, which is one of our newest services. Oh, new, <clears throat> pardon me, our newest service. It is a low-cost, easy-to-use digital repository and preservation service to store, manage, and preserve digital files and collections. Uh, Vault leverages our existing nonprofit infrastructure and open source tools supported by the Internet Archive for collecting, providing access, and ensuring the preservation of digital collections. And I know a lot of us are working in digital preservation here, of course, um, and Vault has a lot of those similar features. Format flexibility, geolocation and replication, fixity audits and repairs, and collection and user role management. Today, we'll be delving more into ARCH, or Archives Research Compute Hub which is a research and teaching service that helps users easily build, analyze, and publish, publish and preserve web archive data sets at scale. Arch allows you to generate data sets from Archivit, from Archivit collections, excuse me. And you can then analyze these data sets with analysis and visual, visualization tools directly within Arch or using third-party analysis tools like we'll be uh, demonstrating today. We also have Internet Archive Scholar, which is a full text search index that includes over 35 million research articles. 
and other scholarly and other scholarly documents preserved in the Internet Archive. The collection can span from um, digitized copies of 18th century journals to the latest open access conference proceedings and preprints that are crawled from the web. We also do digitization, which is another well-known service that we uh, that we do. Uh, and the Internet Archive partners with um, the Internet Archive has digitization centers all over the U.S., the U.K., um, and Canada. Uh, we also have um, capacity for audiovisual digitization services as well. We've digitized over 1 billion pages and do around uh, scan around 2,000 books each day. And finally, and I'll delve more into community programs in our next slide as well, the community programs at the Internet Archive helps memory and research organizations around the world provide universal access to all knowledge. We achieve this mission through programs backed by our internationally distributed nonprofit infrastructure and services, and we work with partners to develop sustainable efforts that respond directly to community needs. These are some of our community programs and some funding that we've received from pro for programmatic support. Namely, we have the um, Community Webs program and the Carter program. For Community Webs, which was launched in 2017, uh, this program advances public libraries and other cultural heritage organizations' capacity to build archives of web-published primary sources, documenting local history and underrepresented voices. More than 150 public libraries and other cultural organizations have joined Community Webs since its launch in 2017. These organizations have collectively archived over 100 terabytes of web-based community heritage materials, and including over 800 collections documenting the lives of local citizens, marginalized voices, and uh, groups that are often absent from the historic record. We also have uh, CARDA, or the Collaborative Art Archive, which is a collaborative group of art libraries building collections of web-based content related to art history and contemporary art practice through a consortial approach, a collaborative approach. The project leverages shared infrastructure, expertise, and collecting activities amongst participating organizations, scaling the extent of web-published web published born digital materials preserved and accessible for art scholarship and research. CARTA is a, a distributed collaborative group, like I said, of over 40 art libraries. And it, and it has preserved and made accessible over 900 websites and over 16 terabytes of data with continued growth to this day. CARTA member organizations, as part of their curating and collecting efforts, identify and nominate websites to be included in the CARTA portal, which is at carta.archivit.org. Uh, Maybe we'll, we'll drop a link in chat if you want to check it out. And these sites uh, fit within eight curated and scoped collections that the members created, which are art criticism, art fairs and events, art galleries, art history slash art scholarship, artist websites, arts educations, arts organizations, and auction houses. And CARTA is deeply invested in using uh, and promoting the highly diverse potential of these collections as open educational resources, and we will be using one of these collections in our demo today. A little bit more about ARCH or Archives Research Commute, Compute Hub. As mentioned, the web archive collections created in Archivit form the basis of the data sets in ARCH, but we are currently working to expand this uh, beyond web archive collections for more digital collections analysis. This is a big step forward in facilitating computational research with web archives, in that it allows researchers to easily reach the point where they have a usable data set that they can analyze. ARCH was developed in collaboration with the Archives Unleashed project listed here, and a support from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. This project sought to make historical internet content accessible to scholars and others for web archive research, and ARCH was developed out of that project. So we'll showcase how to use ARCH to analyze a CARTA data set today during our demo. But before that, I'm gonna turn it over to Carl, who will discuss web archives' data and how ARCH assists with analyzing web archives' data. All right, thank you, Sarah Beth. And you can hear my microphone? Okay, coming through, great, thank you. Um, so I like to start with web archives because web archives are this kind of wonderfully messy format to start with, right? To bring some order to because they comprise so many of the different formats and timelines and scales of born digital collections all in kind of one bucket. And uh, most importantly for today, uh, without the necessary computing and instrumentation, they're a real challenge uh, to actually work with on the end user and steward side that we serve. But before we get into the details, let's start with some uh, simple definitions on the next slide. Thank you. 
we'll delve deeper into um, exactly what it's made of. But just to define uh, terms at the start, we like to describe a web archive as, as a collection of documents, uh, essentially, published originally to the web uh, and preserved in that original context, uh, typically grouped by some kind of theme, event, subject area, or web domain. So many of you, for instance, maintain archives of your institution's web domains, others uh, uh, support subject collecting strengths across media types. What we want to focus on specifically today, though, is that these are, in the end, big collections of documents, uh, which make them rich primary sources for distant reading, uh, natural language processing, all sorts of other digital humanities applications. For a while, I think that web archive has been kind of synonymous with uh, the LARC and earlier ARC formats uh, and with the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine, uh, which is very open uh, in terms of access, but kind of almost impenetrable uh, to scholars and students and developers who want to use that collection uh, as data. I'll show some examples on the next slide. Yes, thank you. We've uh, participated in summarizing the contents of the web in all, all sorts of interesting ways for as, basically as long as there have been web crawls, but we're moving into a period now that Sarah Beth uh, hinted at where uh, digital scholarship is open and can be led by scholars who aren't necessarily the world's foremost experts in web science, uh, just to get uh, started. And what you see here, for instance, just some quick details uh, pulled from studies that will be published in uh, the journal Inter Internet Histories later this year by two research teams led by sociologists who had only just begun using primary sources from the web for the Archives Unleashed project about a year or two ago. So on the left, for instance, um, uh, Dr. Emily Edwards uh, is mapping influence networks among Mormon mommy bloggers of the aughts and 2010s using something called an Arch web graph data set here. Uh, and on the right, uh, Dr. Rosario Rogel Salazar's initial engrams uh, that uh, her team was working on for bilingual topic modeling of feminist movement websites uh, in Latin America specifically made with uh, the Arch PDF file data set. Both visualizations made uh, possible with some standard tools of the DH trade. I think that's Geffy on the left and NLTK uh, on the right, but don't quote me yet uh, until that's published. Uh, let's jump to the next slide first. Thanks. If you maintain web archives, though, you've probably um, seen something that's a little bit more akin to this, right? That this is the uh, Carta site uh, that Sarah Beth mentioned, and I think Cody shared in the, the chat. This is what a typical access layer um, has kind of looked like um, for several years now. It's a list of URLs for websites, pages, feeds, um, along with any uh, uh, descriptive metadata and faceting and full text search capability sometimes, uh, all of which will lead you uh, to what you see on the right a page preserved in its original form and functionality, plus you know, some kind of context uh, injected to say when and why it was archived and information might not be current, but that's kind of the point. Straightforward kind of emulation of what we would call the live web. And you can use it that way uh, by browsing it and reading it sort of one page at a time up close. Let's take a look at what it looks like under the hood. Oh, really quick, and we'll blow this up in a second. This is what it looks like um, to the software, for instance, that lives between a collections server and your web browser. Uh, this is how it's interpreted uh, to piece together the parts of a collection like you'd expect them to read and work like websites. Uh, so let's actually take a closer look at uh, the content of this WARC file. Thank you. There we have it. So this is uh, an example of a, a WARC or web archive file. It's a container file, not unlike a, a zip or a tar in that way. It's made up of technical metadata headers uh, and content blocks. And this is what's called um, in, uh, here in particular, a response record for the page that we just saw. So what it includes is some context up at the top to let any rendering or reading tool know things like uh, what format it's in, what the original URL uh, being preserved was, when it was collected, the, the uh, uh, checksum value, a mime type, a bit length. Then we have the actual uh, response record from the live server 
that was preserved below. Um, this includes things like the status code and the other headers that the server passed uh, to us uh, at the time of collecting, along with the payload. So in this case, the verbatim HTML markup of the page. At least one of these records exists for every document in a web archive, uh, whatever the format might be. So this is kind of what makes web archives so disproportionately huge uh, and hard to deal with, I would say, and why we derive more scalable uh, research data sets from them. Let's kind of put a pause on it there for a second, because I don't want to lose anyone quite yet. There are a lot of good references to get into more detail when you want, including the full specs uh, from the maintainers at the International Internet Preservation Consortium. And um, on the archive at side, we, we produced a, a kind of introductory guide to the work file with a, a live uh, webinar and, and written up version that uh, I think is a great place to start for beginners. But just before we get into kind of some creative use of this actual data, any questions that we can answer first about kind of the makeup uh, or the format? Some of you have probably seen me give this presentation before. Yes, yeah, we know, Carl, move on. Well, do continue to um, send uh, questions in at any point over the Q&A and chat tools uh, that Cody can use to escalate um, anything to us. And we'll have a, another chance at the end, but I don't think I'm seeing any surface in the meantime, so we can move on. All right. Now, so as I, as I mentioned in general, web archives have posed a significant barrier to researchers who want to approach them computationally and at scale for, for these kinds of reasons. Just getting access to them in, to begin with, um, we found in, in our experience is kind of a project in and of itself, both for um, the researcher and the custodian in this case, because it's huge unwieldy uh, sets of data that we don't have a, a lot of standards for moving uh, and describing and storing. Uh, we kind of pass that burden on uh, to the end user, the, the student researcher or scholar um, in this case to, to kind of roll their own. And as a result, um, there has been kind of a little development of any community of practice around web archives, such that um, these researchers can share their methods and their data and kind of start to build on each other the way the Archives Unleashed cohort have done. So that's where uh, we, we like to, to aim Arch to make the most direct interventions. Uh, on the next slide. So these are our, our kind of goals, um, how we know we will have succeeded with uh, the tooling uh, when we get there. What we wanted to aim for was to create um, hopefully user-friendly interface where uh, users could at almost the push of a button, as you'll see, uh, request scalable data in predictable standardized familiar formats um, in browser visualizations when possible to give uh, an indication of what's uh, in the data set and what can be done with it, but also lots of instruction, uh, like we'll just preview a little bit later in the form of uh, tutorials and Jupyter Notebooks uh, for those who are ready to work with data sets up close. All of it, again, open source. Um, Arch uh, is available at the GitHub repository linked, all of the same job types um, that you will see to derive data from work files. Um, can be seen there. But the great thing about having all of the storage and compute uh, resources that we do have is that we can host it ourselves and run a web application um, that hopefully makes it easy for you. Uh, so let's jump into that now and show you what it looks like. If you have an environment set up that is especially conducive to um, following along with us live, you're very welcome to do so. But uh, the credentials for the, the kind of demo account are there. I think the username is BCC. You can totally access that later with the same uh, data in the download that Cody provided. Um, we'll keep that open. Uh, and we'll jump into Arch. 
So this is what every Arch account looks like, uh, generally. If you've used Archive It before or Vault, the preservation repository service, you probably recognize this template, uh, trying to maintain kind of a streamlined uh, uh, experience uh, of collections across service lines. Those collections, the Archive It, in this case, Web Archive collections are listed at the left. Um, just a, a sample set for now that you're free to work with. I have the art galleries section in there for now, for instance, from Carta. And one thing that we found out pretty immediately that we needed to support uh, here was uh, get a little bit more specific with what we want to use as our primary source data set. If you don't, if rather, uh, if you do want to combine or split or subdivide or mix and match kind of the data in different web archive collections into kind of a more customized collection, you can do that here. For instance, today's demo, just to be uh, a little bit humane on uh, uh, Sarah Beth's bandwidth, um, we're going to focus on a few galleries from the art galleries collection uh, that represent uh, coverage in the city of Baltimore. Already from there, you can see we're uh, going down in collection size from over 800 gigabytes to just six, um, and we'll make things even more uh, kind of human scale from there. All of the data sets uh, that are uh, derived from these collections, uh, there's a quick uh, access point to them. They are listed on the right, the most recent at the top, but at any point that we want to create a new one or uh, a new iteration of one, we can click the generate new data set link. Let's go there next. So this is where, um, and if we select uh, the Art Galleries Baltimore City collection from the, the drop down, but really any of them, we will get this menu of, as I suggested, kind of standard data set types. 12 of them uh, for now, nine in CSV format. Uh, again, the emphasis being on accessibility to as many different researchers as possible. Uh, three of them are in JSON as well. And they range from as, as broad as up at the very top. We have, for instance, a data set that's just a tell me how many times uh, or how many uh, documents from this web domain appear in my collection uh, for basic graphical uh, or statistical purposes. And to get that, um, Sarah Beth just needs to click on the generate data set button. And this one actually is a small enough collection um, that we might get to see it before the end of the demo. Depending on the scale um, we're working at, uh, multiple terabytes versus uh, a couple of gigabytes, um, that process can take a little uh, different amount of time to run. Scrolling down, we have some data sets organized uh, by other types. Uh, I showed, for instance, a, a detail of a, a network graph. Uh, there are three, if I re recall correctly, network uh, graph data set types that support uh, getting the data and creating visualizations for the hyperlinks among, for one thing, websites in a collection uh, at the domain level or every individual document level uh, that links uh, to one another and to do that over time. Um, so you can see the size and shape and the movement even of a web archive collection over time uh, in graphical form, almost like three-dimensional geographical type form. Of course, everybody is excited uh, to use these as big corpora of text, which they certainly are. Uh, we'll do a little bit of that uh, in a moment, for example. There are a few data sets uh, that we produce by default that uh, use or provide the raw plain text data from web pages. Uh, we'll use the plain text data set in a moment and we do some second level uh, analysis like named entity recognition. What we can also do is provide the location if you want to actually get a, um, a download and the technical metadata about each of the documents in a web archive collection that bears text. So that's not just the HTML, but um, PDF files, uh, as I mentioned before, and Word documents, even the CSS, JavaScript, whatever the case may be. We can do that for anything that has a MIME type, uh, since that is preserved in those work records. So the last kind of category of data sets that we provide out of the box today are things like all of the video files, audio files, presentation formats, and um, 
spreadsheet formats, whatever the case may be, if you want access to those for preservation purposes or curation purposes uh, from within a larger scope of web crawls. Let's take a look at one up close. Uh, I, I mentioned the text data set. Um, so let's go there now. The plain text of web pages data set uh, we will use for today's demo. Just uh, after that's completed, it turns into a few data sets link uh, on the page there. And every data set um, will have an access point that has a, a variation of this. It starts with uh, the data itself for download, uh, description of the file type. We've got a zipped CSV here with some technical metadata about just the, the data volume, number of lines, when it was created, and how it can be validated. And you can download that to your um, machine. So already um, we've cut down our scope uh, for researching this collection as data from 800 gigabytes to three megabytes, uh, maybe a little bit more accessible, uh, at least if we're focused. When you uh, have uh, a scholar or a colleague uh, who is interested in using a source like this as data, they may have specific ideas in mind already for the kind of software tooling they want to use. Either way, um, we provide some of that out of the box. This same data set can be staged on Google Colab where you can run uh, our Jupyter notebooks in order to get a little bit more familiar with the format for one thing and framing it as you know, in data frames for a more spreadsheet type experience and then walking through the steps um, to start you know, high level analysis with tools like NLTK, Spacey is increasingly popular um, we find with natural language processing um, and other tools in the more visual graphic formats. Also, you don't have to like, again, use any of your own bandwidth uh, or local resources just to get started. But um, for today, we wanna do something even more, I think, accessible to a wider audience, which is take some of those open software libraries uh, and access them via a kind of dashboard layer where they're brought together uh, called Voyant. So before we Jump over there, actually, I forgot. Let's take a look at the data. <laughs> uh, so, and I think we get a preview of it here, but Sarah Beth, you have it kind of blown up to full size. This is what the actual CSV file um, will look like when you download it. So going uh, uh, across the, the attributes here, we have things like the timestamp at which each one of these HTML web pages was archived, uh, the domain that it came from, if we wanna organize it that way, which we'll do for today. The individual page URL, uh, where we can find it in the archive. Two types of uh, characterization. Uh, when, again, we collect that original resource from the web, it gets reported to us with a MIME type. We validate that with uh, Apache Tika in the, in the data set job process. Uh, and while we're running that tool, we get to do things like uh, also detect the language, um, which could be useful to sort and filter later. One thing that we've added since actually creating this data set, it looks like, is the, the last modified date uh, as well, which is in the work record when it's provided by the server. But then, yeah, at the end, as promised, the, the raw text of each page stripped of its markup so you can analyze it like you would a book or a manuscript or any other large corpus of text. So let's do that now. I mentioned Voyant uh, is this pretty low barrier popular tool uh, maintained primarily by uh, teams at uh, University of Alberta and McGill University, if I remember correctly, but also others, where you can get a, a, an initial sort of uh, pass at some of the more popular styles, methodologies, uh, and tools. All you have to do is upload a text file or a zip file. So the, the web pages.zip file in our sample download for today uh, will suffice. That has our plain text of web pages. Take a minute, depending on the size of your corpus. But then we're off to the races. So by default, um, there are what, five pieces of the dashboard uh, presented right out of the box and a lot more that we can use. Things look like, uh, just moving clockwise here from the top left, a, a word cloud. Everybody loves word clouds uh, because they're useless, but uh, we can start to just kind of get a sense of things from there. Uh, the actual full text uh, in, a, in an editor type view. 
we have trend lines uh, in order to compare term frequencies, correlations that we'll see in a moment, either over time or in this case over a uh, span of different domains. Below that, um, the individual terms can be pulled out um, in their context. So you can see, for instance, exactly in line where they appear with uh, the word, key words and phrases before and after. And uh, at the bottom left, a, a statistical summary of the different um, individual sources in the text. So we can see things like we've got readability uh, grades there. And I find um, kind of most interesting for like curatorial or, or especially descriptive purposes down at the bottom, we start to get a, a, an initial glimpse at the distinctive words in each source. These are like kind of the most unique among frequency uh, for each individual source. So I can see, uh, for example, um, the Springsteen Gallery site, number six there has things like oil and canvas and acrylic. So this is like, this might be kind of a, a good source uh, for painting uh, research uh, in modern galleries in the COVID era. Whereas uh, the Waller Gallery below it, which is a traditionally um, uh, kind of exhibitor of black artists in Baltimore also has a kind of particular strength in transgender subjects or artists. Um, so it might be worth delving deeper into. Let's give an example of what we can do with this uh, briefly though. As I mentioned, there are, there are more tools available here than I've even tried yet, um, but we'll start with some simple examples. Like instead of the word cloud, Sarah Beth, why don't you select the terms list? Um, this is just a more kind of ranking of the most frequently used words in our corpus. So no surprise, for instance, that things like Baltimore and art uh, are very much right up at the top. And we can select any of these if we want to see where they plot on the, on the trend line graph comparing frequencies uh, in different sites. So let's try something like, you know, Select um, new number two and York number six. So I, you can probably imagine, but uh, the, the correlation uh, that you see here on the right is indicative of, sure, the words new and York frequently appear together in a data set like this because there's discussion of um, artists from New York City or uh, who went to New York schools or institutes uh, kind of discourse generally with a New York art scene uh, in the city of Baltimore throughout the corpus. But for instance, I can see already that I might want to focus uh, some of my research on the Nudishank Gallery in Baltimore if I want to see more about that Baltimore to New York connection. This is uh, a good kind of initial example of using a web archive uh, text data set for uh, correlation. Uh, what we can also do is something more like co-location. So not just words that appear frequently near each other, but right next to each other. And for that, we have the links tool, uh, again, at the top left. If I were oh, a scholar, for instance, um, studying, uh, I don't know, um, video uh, art and exhibition and installation, during uh, the pandemic period in public galleries, um, I could use something like this. What we get is those same, again, uh, top terms by default. And the words that appear most frequently with them, like in that uh, uh, context pane you see at the bottom right, represented by literally like the, the size of the words and the thickness of uh, the line between them. So in this case, we could clear the, the top results um, with the little trash can icon there and put in something like our uh, just video to see how many different topics um, that's kind of related to in our data set and even kind of bring them up in context. So I mentioned video installation, for instance. Sarah Beth, why don't you just click on that line? What that will give us uh, right off the bat again is our trend line graph, for instance, we can see comparatively which maybe sources in the collection are a particular strength for uh, that exhibition type or medium. 
And if I want to delve into the details, uh, we could click on one of them, like the, the ICA Baltimore site maybe, and get the context uh, more up close to learn more about that. This is like very, <laughs> very high level uh, demonstration of like what's possible to do with uh, the collection as data. It gets much more interesting from here. And I just want to reiterate again, that um, as you find you want to do more custom kind of analysis or make your own parameters or visualization choices uh, to start with the command line tools that are demonstrated in, in the notebooks as well. But I think that gives a pretty good uh, overview and how useful these sorts of data sets can be when, for instance, uh, like a couple of examples we've seen from this collection already, the sites are coming down um, they're no longer available. They're only really available in this format. Um, and so much of what is available on the live web is, um, it, it's getting different out there. Let's go back to the slide deck though. I wanna point out that this, uh, and thank you, Sarah Beth, very, <laughs> thank you for uh, willing participation uh, in that uh, uh, test drive with me. Uh, anyone uh, again can, can follow these uh, same steps and more with this example data set and uh, others in our Help Center guide where we have tutorials for using web-based tools like we have some network uh, graphing examples using Stanford's Palladio tool and Gephi, which I mentioned before, which is a pretty popular one, a desktop tool, ways to collage images in this case, but it can really be done with any of the file type data sets and uh, the notebooks for, for getting under the hood a little bit more. Um, so those uh, are available anytime, regardless of your access to the Arch web application, but we do also have a free to use um, tier of service that anyone can sign up for to get access to what you have today. Um, those sample web archive collections and data sets that we've already produced, but you can produce um, your own from them as well. To do that uh, on the next, Slide, Sarah Beth, I think we put, yeah, just our kind of front door for the Arch service there at the bottom, webservices.archive.org uh, slash pages slash Arch, which is where to find everything um, Arch related, but also the team. Um, so we can set you up with something to get uh, a little bit more familiar with up close. Want to start taking uh, questions in a minute because i um, very interested in your, in your feedback so far. Uh, but we did want to also plant a few seeds for discussion today or certainly take these home with you. Think about them in a quiet moment like I do washing the dishes or something. We're still gathering a lot of feedback amongst our first users and beta testers and from audiences like you about how you could see something like this in your case fitting into a digital preservation workflow um, for the source files themselves or the web archives or um, for your institutions. As Sarah Beth mentioned, we're expanding Arch to cover any other collection type that we can host, not just the web archives now, but we're expanding that to other uh, holdings in the internet archive and indeed starting to practice with some uh, grant funded partners on ingesting their collections uh, right straight into our preservation system for Arch use. And of course, always want to hear uh, your initial feedback on the barriers um, that you would see to actually using um, a, a service like this for doing computational research with, with something like web archives in your institution. Um, so I, I, will, I will pitch those to, to you. I think um, we have ample time <laughs> on the clock to uh, answer questions, uh, certainly, that indicates we went through the demo pretty quickly. So anything we can uh, circle back to, say more about, um, display a little bit more, um, let us know. Looks like we may have a question comment from Catherine. See a hand raised, but maybe not. Oh, Zoom problems. Never mind. Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? Feel free to drop them in the chat. Q and A. I can 
If you raise a hand, I can also help you unmute. Hundred attendees and no questions. I don't believe it. We have a question. What's the process for signing up for Arch and making it available for our users? Hmm. Great question. Um, certainly start with the link on the screen. Where that will direct you, though, is to email our team. And we can set you up in a couple of different ways, depending on um, what your uh, who your users are. That is, if you are an Archive It subscriber and wants to uh, use Arch for those web archive collections um, or other collections or just for yourself in, in the um, free service tier level sort of things, that's where we would begin. I should, I should say like, like archive it, um, Arch is run on a, on a cost recovery model, um, for the, the bits in and out and the, the engineering resources and labor. Um, so like archive it, um, there is, uh, a, there are a couple of different tiers based on just the, the amount of compute and resources involved. Got a couple more questions coming in for you. This next one, have there been any successful use cases, case studies of people using the Arch GitHub code yet? This is particularly for an institution that may struggle to pay for an additional service. Good question. Maybe Sarah Beth, unless you know of one that I don't, um, not yet. Uh, it's pretty new. Um, so that's not a, a, a terrible surprise. And it does have kind of a high barrier to clear in terms of available uh, storage and, and compute resources and just the works. Um, you need to be someone who collected a lot of works uh, to work that, but um, there, there is certainly an opportunity there. Our next question, can Arch be used with any work or just with the web archives already in the Internet Archives corpus? The web application that we demoed today is set up for archive it. Uh, collections, that is. Um, the Arch software, generally the, you know, the open source version, um, could be run on any, any works that you have access to um, in, a, in a file directory. Uh, that said, you know, if there is like a specific corpus that you have in, in mind, um, something that could be uploaded um, or uh, uh, something from the Wayback Machine, uh, we could we could take a look into that. Not unprecedented. Not to put you on the spot here, Carl, but I'd also be interested if you have any updates for this group about working with other digital born collections outside of work files. Yeah, so that's that's the focus of the current grant that we are working on. It's a two year IMLS grant um, with a half dozen custodial partners so far uh, to kind of spec out for one thing, uh, how, how to ingest uh, the, the data um, to, so that we can do the, the interesting part, I think, uh, which is the, the kind of next level of deriving useful data sets. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe we're in the right place to talk about uh, ingest specs, but where we're at now uh, with that is we're kind of at the, uh, piloting stage of a couple of collections that we've gotten into storage. We've run basic job types on them to kind of establish that we can index uh, the content and run the process. It, it's kind of, if your if folks are familiar, all based a little bit on uh, Apache Spark, the jobs uh, that run. Um, and those have been successful. Um, so what we're starting to engage now is a little bit more of the, the researcher expectations of the specific uh, data sets um, that they would like to derive. Are we talking about 
you know, transcripts uh, from audio collections and video collections? Are we putting simple named entity recognition jobs on other types uh, of text that we have access to? One of the collections that we're working with is a big collection of PDFs and images in various states of OCR. Um, so getting them research ready um, is, is going to be a challenge, but baby steps, um, certainly. We we're at, I think, two or three of those collections ingested now and working on representing them in Arch and running the jobs. So a good time actually to, to, um, to get in touch if you have uh, a media type that is especially locked up uh, in, in the archive and, and really wants to be free. Cliff writes, this seems like a good tool for digital humanities work. And we, we certainly agree and hope so too, Cliff. Um, the question here is, have you seen any other communities of practice actively using ARCH for research purposes? Yeah, as I mentioned in the, in the last cohort, especially of Archives Unleashed, uh, researchers. We saw a lot of interest among sociologists in particular, I think because they have that social science um, approach to, for instance, cultural and, and historical uh, subjects. Um, so it's, it's definitely there. And it really, you know, a lot of these methods, um, which can, can make them challenging to work with uh, for, for beginners, are born out of um, computer science research. Uh, and we've certainly kind of had a, a longstanding relationship there with several uh, of our frequent academic partners who use WARCs as data sets for studying communication networks from like a technical uh, level. And that's still uh, eminently possible. Another question here, is it possible to train your own model for named entity recognition using Arch or possibly pull in models created from other organizations? Great question. Them. Yeah. So this is another, this is another active uh, piece of development now is the, like adding the parameters to the job. So not today, um, as far as I'm aware, is the short answer uh, of the question. We run Stanford's named ent entity recognition uh, tool to create those data sets today, but um, we're looking forward to parameterizing that um, to incorporate other language models, or indeed, um, as suggested, custom models. We have you know, uh, an Arch user who's particularly interested in doing this in Chinese, for instance. Um, so we'll start there in other languages um, and hopefully get to open that up to your configurations. I apologize for uh, uh, taking all of these, but uh, I think they, they have a product uh, theme to them so far. Good questions. Any other questions? You did such a good job, Carl and Sarah. <laughs> well, it's it's a challenge um, to do. Still, still getting to to, to learn how best to do uh, live demonstrations of these things on Zoom or in in online spaces like this. So, if you have feedback um, to that effect, to really open to hearing it, uh, because we do want to keep getting these tools in front of as many people as possible before um, they. Calcify uh, and and uh, and become kind of uh, rigid, um, and get in front of uh, the data sets. Uh, these these data sets are again available for you at uh, sort of on demand, I guess, uh, and the tutorials to go with them. So conversation certainly can continue from there. A good question here related to uh, Sibby's talk yesterday and other work in the area. Um, could you speak to the environmental impact of using ARCH? Um, I'm not sure. Um, uh, I didn't 
see Sybil's talk uh, yesterday, but if there's a like a specific question about like the carbon footprint of the computing process or the storage, um, we could certainly get details on that from the engineers. That's yeah. A good question. Yeah, a really good question. One, I know uh, as uh, the Internet Archive owns and operates our own data centers, um, it's definitely something that comes up quite often. Um, so this is certainly something we are thinking about. Yeah, and there was a really good um, kind of introduction to those written, I think, around the, the 25th uh, anniversary, was it? Uh, 20th anniversary in 2016, rather? Um, where our director of engineering kind of detailed out what those data centers uh, comprise and how they're managed and, you know, what the approach to storage and environmental conditions is there. Um, if I had that at my fingertips, I would drop it in the chat. Yeah, a great question. Thank you for it. Now I see some folks maybe dropping off, depending on time zone, maybe grabbing food or taking a break. We know it's been a full week. We appreciate everybody joining us. If we're ready.